Yo! Welcome back, ninjas. Vitor here and really excited to be with all of you again. We had planned to go over a capacitive circuit today, but some of the premium content on the community tab generated quite a bit of debate. So much so that we even decided to bet a beer with the Redditor. You will play judge and jury today. The bet is simple. Can the circuit perform a given function? We hope you can watch until the end and help us decide whether the team has earned that beer or not. The circuit is the following. And it seemed to confuse several of you. Side note, we would like to use this opportunity to highlight how ego and arrogance can get in the way of you having a successful interview. Now, you would think we are talking about you, the interviewee. Actually, no. We are talking about the ego of the interviewers themselves. There will be places where you genuinely feel you enjoy the interview, independent of the outcome. And there will be places where it just seems like a hostile environment. Ultimately, it will be your choice where you want to work. With that said, we will be using snippets of a discussion in Reddit to illustrate this point. We have deleted the thread to avoid prompting harassment, but a redacted copy can be found in the description of the video. Let's look at the circuit one more time. I will give you 10 seconds to pause the video and try to solve the function of the circuit. As you know, in this channel, we are not after the right or wrong answer. Instead, we aim to get you to think abstractly and show your problem solving skills. That's what interviewing is all about. We will never shame anyone for an incorrect answer. That being said, we received several answers about the circuit. However, this particular user, let's call him Bob, decided to comment the following. You need to provide device sizes since they greatly affect the answer. He made an edit after we provided the answer, but we will get into that later. Let's think here for a second. While this question, on its surface, looks fair, always remember the following. Interviewers are all about open-ended questions and operating in ambiguity. So let's try to answer this question. Let's try to figure out what this circuit does. And let's start by labeling the devices. We have always emphasized the point of asking questions to the interviewer. In this case, a prudent question would be, can I assume that all my devices are equal? Let's say the interviewer says, yes, you can assume that. Let's keep working towards the solution. You might be tempted to think that this is simply a current mirror with a cast code device. After all, it's a familiar structure to everyone involved in analog IC design. However, nothing has been said about the currents, so we cannot conclude that. Just because it looks like a familiar structure doesn't mean that's exactly what the circuit is doing. So, you can ask the interviewer about the current sources and their values, or you can start assuming them. But, always state your assumptions out loud. You can say, well, as a first pass, let me assume that I2 is greater than I1. I2 will provide a VGS on M4. If I2 is large enough, the source of M3 will be high enough to keep M2 in saturation. If M2 is in saturation, we have a mirror between M1 and M2. So the output current at the black box is I1. The interviewer might say, all right, so what happens when I2 is less than I1? We would answer the question in the following way. If I1 is large, then the VGS of M1 is high. That means the overdrive voltage of M2 must be high. However, if I2 is lower than I1, then the low VGS from M4 means the source of M3 is low and won't satisfy the overdrive voltage condition of M2. This puts M2 in triode. It can be said that the VGS of M4 and VGS of M3 are now equal. Let me pause one more time here. We are assuming an ideal transistor here, as most interviews do. If M2 is in triode, then its resistance can be assumed to be very, very small, in an ideal case. We know in practice this is not true. 
In either case, we can say that M3 is now in saturation and M3 and M4 form a mirror. So the black box will see I2 in the ideal case or I2 minus a delta in the case you assume degeneration of the source. Let's summarize up until now. We said that when I2 is greater than I1, the output will be I1. When I1 is greater than I2, the output will be I2. This looks like a minimum function, right? A minimum current selector, if you will. The output will always be the minimum of the two currents. Now Bob, being Bob, decided to stick to his guns and said the following. You should simulate that circuit. It's 100% not a minimum function. I am so sorry, but we do not get an education to become simulator monkeys. Maybe Bob is one. Don't be like Bob. After explaining to Bob, we should not be simulator monkeys. And just because he cannot simulate a circuit, it doesn't mean it won't act that way. Of course, he proceeded to let his ego battle with our argument. Bob wanted to show off his quote, quote, credentials that are 20 years of experience and a PhD from roughly two decades ago. Again, don't be like Bob. The moment you start to believe that due to your years of experience or your PhD, you have seen it all and there's nothing else you can learn, that's the moment you stop growing as an engineer. This is advice for our recent college grads and especially for our experienced engineers. Let's keep analyzing the circuit though. There is one more case the interviewer will bring up and he will say, what happens when I1 is equal to I2? Let's evaluate that situation. If I1 is equal to I2, that means the VGS of M1 is equal to the VGS of M4. In other words, the gate voltages of all devices are equal. If that's the case, the equivalent circuit becomes the following. Now M3 and M2 form a single device of the original width, but twice the original length. That means the output will see I over two, where I is equal to I1 that is equal to I2. This is of course a nonlinear circuit around I1 equals I2. So naturally Bob decided to explain that because of this nonlinearity, the circuit cannot be described as a minimum current selector because when I1 is equal to I2, it cannot resolve the minimum function. Well, there is no minimum, right? If both are equal, what is the minimum? We knew Bob would not be pleased with that explanation, so we decided to give him and you the following explanation. Let's take an ideal inverter. An inverter is meant to invert any input. If you have a supply of VDD, then any input below VDD over two will output a logic high. Any input above VDD over two will output a logic zero. What happens, however, at exactly VDD over two? The ideal inverter will never resolve, right? Just because it cannot resolve that particular instance doesn't mean it cannot be used as an inverter, right? We would like to hear what you think about this analogy. So the answer to the original question, of course, is that the circuit is used as a minimum current selector. A final side note, Bob also claims to be a hiring manager slash interviewer. We can also see that Bob is determined to be right. If you are right in front of Bob during an interview, it's rather obvious he will never ask open-ended questions as he likes to be validated by being right. Due to this need of validation, Bob will dismiss any candidate independent of their potential because they couldn't see a circuit the way Bob considers to be the right way. You will face many Bobs during your interviewing journey. Don't let that discourage you. Failing interviews with Bobs does not reflect your ability, knowledge, or even potential. And that's all we have for you today. Do you think Bob owes us that beer? Are you convinced this is a minimum current selector or not? Let us know in the comments, smash that like and subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.